Hi, I'm Janice Barnholtz Province, and this is hyperoxia. Is it possible to have too much of a good thing? Well, I'm not talking about the patient who doesn't have an airway and needs one established, or a patient who is hypoxic and clearly needs to have some supplemental oxygen. But remember, we used to have our trauma patients always coming in on 100% non-rebreather mask. Is that always necessary anymore? So we're rethinking the way we deliver our oxygen, whether it's via non-rebreather mask, or if the patient's on a vent, or if they're being ventilated with a bag valve mask. We have a pulse ox now to help guide our oxygen delivery. So we all know that when we're on the beach and we're breathing room air, the fraction of inspired oxygen is 21%. So if we were to put a pulse ox on our finger, we could quickly get an O2 sat. But what we can't so easily, easily obtain is a PaO2. That requires an invasive procedure, an AVG. So how do we know, how does the SpO2 or the O2 sat correlate to the PaO2? And are those numbers always the same? Oh no, not the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. So if we look at the O2 sat, and we bring that number over onto the left hand axis there and we look at our PaO2 from our ABG and bring that down below and we have a patient who's satting anywhere from 98 to 100 percent we draw a line across and you see that pink line falls on the top of the S curve and then you drop it down and you'll see that the PaO2 is anywhere from 80 to 100 percent but what about if we crank up the O2? Now what is our patient's PaO2 when they're satting 98 to 100%? It can be anywhere from 80 to 500. So we first got a glimpse of our oxygen delivery um, changing when we took our latest and greatest TNCC, or excuse me, not TNCC, BLS and ACLS in 2010. And we looked at how we treat our acute coronary syndrome patients. So the MONA that we all love and know and we used to do for every single patient changed. So oxygen was only being administered now if the O2 sat was less than 94%. And then we're only titrating our, our oxygen to a SpO2 or pulse ox at or above 94%. So indeed, there is a possibility of having too much of a good thing. So prior to the 2010 changes, there were articles that came out about hyperoxia and in hospital mortality. And then after that as well, addressing hyperoxia in in hospital mortality, either with cardiac arrest patients or traumatic brain injured patients. Here's one article that talks about the patient who has survived cardiac arrest but they looked at their oxygenation. And in this study of almost 6,500 patients, they split their patients into three groups depending on what their, um, what their PaO2 was when they got that first ABG in the ICU. The first group, the hyperoxia group, the definition that they used was a PaO2 greater than 300 hypoxia was less than 60. And what they found is that in the almost 1,200 patients in the hyperoxia group, there were 63% of them died. So what they concluded is that hyperoxia alone caused almost a two-fold increase in death. So they concluded that hyperoxia was an independently associated with increased in-hospital mortality compared to the other two groups. Here's another study that looks at hyperoxia in the traumatic brain injured patient. And of the almost 1,500 patients that they looked at who had survived at least 12 hours in the hospital, when they looked at the hyperoxia group, they defined that as a PaO2 of greater than 200. And they had an almost 50% death rate in the hyperoxia group. So they also concluded that hyperoxia um, was associated with higher mortality rates, but also with worse short-term functional outcomes. And they suggested that a target goal for PaO2 would be anywhere from 100 to 200. In this article, they also brought up, like, why does this happen? And they suggested that a mechanism for this might be that too much O2 causes oxygen-free radical toxicity, either with or without vasoconstriction. 
So what are free radicals? Those are like little vampires that seek out nice, healthy, stable molecules or cells, and they steal away the electrons from those molecules, leaving those poor little guys defenseless and damaged, which can cause disease or death. Here's another article that looked at almost um, 1,200 traumatic brain injury patients where they defined hyperoxia as greater than 300. And when they compared the normal oxia group to the hyperoxia group, again, they found there was an increase in mortality just with having too much O2 alone. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about oxygen toxicity in a hyperoxia talk. So we all know that having a patient on high flow O2 or too much FiO2 for too long can lead to bad things such as acute respiratory distress syndrome. That can be from nitrogen washout. So what is nitrogen washout and what does it do? It can cause an absorption atelectasis. So over on the left we have an alveoli. And in the alveoli, there are gases. 80% of those gases are nitrogen. So there's also the oxygen, which is the 21%, and then CO2 as well. So if we put a patient on oxygen and we crank up the O2, we end up flooding the alveoli with oxygen. So we all know that in the alveoli, what happens is a gas exchange between O2 and CO2. And we also now know that 80% of what, what's in that alveoli is now nitrogen. So when that nitrogen gets pushed out of the way with oxygen, it ends up um, leaving and all that's left in there is oxygen. The oxygen gets diffused away into the bloodstream. The CO2 gets exhaled out and what we're left with is a collapsed alveoli. So what's our target goal for oxygen delivery? It's an O2 sat anywhere from 94 to 98% and a PaO2 of 100 to 200. Thanks.